Okay, well, welcome everyone to this last um, panel session of Streaming Summit 2019. Has, has it been an incredible two days? I hope so. <laughs> yeah, all right. Yeah, lots of good content. Uh, my name is Mark Donegan, I'm uh, your moderator, and I'm with a video technology software company called Beamer, and just to give you some context really quick of um, uh, what my role is here for the panel, and then I'll let the panelists introduce themselves, and we're going to jump into a, a really great discussion. Um, but we are a uh, codec developer, uh, HEVC and H.264, and in that role, um, we frequently find ourselves advising our customers about codec selection. And as I was uh, thinking about what value to bring to the summit, uh, I realized that there's a lot of discussion about, you know, um, which implementation or which codec specifically is more efficient or it's faster or royalties or there's all these kinds of things out there and that's all important. But it's really rare to have operators and vendors and, and, and those in the ecosystem talking about how do you approach codec selection and it's more than just this codec is more efficient than this other one and so therefore it's the logical choice. Um, so with that, we're really excited to bring a lot of value to you and I really um, just wanna start, let everybody introduce themselves, the companies and the roles and then we're going to uh, jump into a fireside chat. So, Ed, start with you. Hi, thanks. Uh, my name's Ed Sylvester. I'm from DAZN and Perform Group. Uh, DAZN, if you've not heard of us, are a rights holder and sports broadcaster. Um, they, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna call it the Netflix of sport, which will make every engineer in the room wince. <laughs> uh, but it's a marketing term, but it does describe pretty precisely, I think, what we do. Great. I'm Dan Pizarski. I'm the VP of Engineering for LiveU. If you're not familiar with LiveView, we do bonded cellular contribution in, uh, encoding. So we make contribution encoding devices uh, and are often working in hardware when it comes to codecs. Uh, used primarily in news, uh, second largest market is sports. Uh, can transmit over multiple cellular connections at the same time so we can contribute encoded video from anywhere in the world. Hi, my name is uh, Stefan Leach. I'm with uh, Satu, a company that's uh, been around for 13 years, and we're actually very happy that the term streaming uh, 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 pops up more and more often in the broadcaster world. So that's something we've been doing for the last 13 years. We're uh, a, 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 TV, a TV broadcaster over the internet. Um, we, we do that for 3 million concurrent uh, uh, monthly unique users, and um, yeah, codec choices is definitely a thing for us. So uh, looking forward to this conversation. I'm uh, Chris Faring with Pac-12 Networks. We're a wholly owned subsidiary of the Pac-12 Conference. Uh, we're a regional sports network. We broadcast uh, over 850 events a year, and then we stream those 24-7. Uh, we also stream a number of other uh, sporting events uh, from, from the schools directly to, to the web on uh, Pac-12.com. Great, thank you. So before we get into, you know, sort of talking about the future in terms of, you know, how you guys are thinking about codec selection, um, let's start and we'll, we'll um, I'll just start with you, Ed, and then, and then go on down. Tell us what codecs are you using today? And, um, you know, in the event that you might be supporting more than two, um, you know, what are, what's your number one and your number two codec? Okay. The short answer would be that I will use whatever codec we have to use based on the requirements of our customers. So I don't even feel like the, the, the base codec selection is really down to us. It's down to what units are out there and what the product needs to support. So we are very much driven by, by the, 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 the fans, really, and the equipment they've got. Um, as we see more uh, shift towards uh, ownership of 265, then there is a plan where we can start the transition. But right now, um, the, the one-size-fit-all codec is H.264. Um, we do have the occasional event coming through, which is gonna be 4K and UHD. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a growing uh, part of the business, but it's a very expensive part of the business. So until we can get the, the cost to work, um, 264 is still primarily there. We're looking forward to shifting to 265, but right now, we've got too much legacy to do that. 264. So uh, mostly focused on two, I would call our primary codec HEVC 265. Uh, the lower bandwidth is important for that first mile field contribution. And we do some 4K as well. 
Uh, but of course, uh, H.264 are units used for a long time before that, and as I'm sure we'll end up talking about during the panel, we had, end up doing a ton of H.265 in the first mile, and then H.264 everywhere after that. So, interesting, an important codec. Great. Um, yeah, we do all AV1. It's perfect. Great <laughs> savings. <laughs> <laughs> Best choice in the world. I think. Uh, <laughs> No, of course, um, H.264 is predominant. It's the smallest common denominator. Uh, um, we built a lot of, I mean, we, we put a lot of effort into optimizing that for our use case the last 10 years. But um, now that we, that we really go more into Ultra HD 4K content, H.265 is a must from our view. Um, and we'll see how we manage to shift over from H.264 to H.265 and see what's beyond. And we stream H.264 to our consumers, of course. Uh, we also, on the upstream of that, we will use uh, JPEG 2000 for contribution, as well as Live View and some other uh, methods there. And uh, we're, looking, we're considering HEVC for contribution specifically. Yeah, it's interesting. So um, you mentioned, Chris, contribution. And, uh, and you know, of course, Dan, um, you're largely contribution from the field. Uh, yep. That's the application. And so I find it interesting that you pointed out that you know, there, there are different codec choices and the decision matrix is a little bit different. We have to be very explicit about whether we're talking about um, distribution, you know, one to many, or if it's one to one or one to you know, three endpoints. And mm -hmm. so that's interesting. So, so Chris, I'd like to um, have you answer this question and then you know, everybody can kind of jump in and follow up. Um, Live versus VOD. So I think it's it's useful um, to 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 discuss how you think about codec selection based on the use case of live versus VOD. Obviously, you're operating a live service, and uh, I know we have some others that are operating more VOD services. But uh, tell us how you think about that, and then maybe do, does the Pac-12 have VOD? I assume you do yeah. offer. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. So yeah. Um, Talk to us about that. Yeah. So uh, I actually wrote down a, a great quote from uh, Dominic at CBS in, in an earlier session this afternoon. He said, the way he put it, uh, the expectation for live sports is that it's, uh, it's going to be a flawless TV-like ex experience. And we, we definitely see the difference between uh, live and VOD in, in terms of the audience, obviously, and in terms of the importance that we, that we put on it. Uh, that said, we're, we're using H.264 for both. Uh, the real difference comes in the, the um, reliability and quality and latency. Uh, for example, we'll take the time to do a two-passing code for uh, VOD, and latency is more important for, for live. That's exactly how we do it as well. We, we, do, we have a, uh, the 264 codec goes out for catch-up and for um, a, like an instant VOD experience. Mm. People don't want to wait for a, a, right. a polished present. Also, we find that the, the entire game VOD is not as popular as a highlight. Sure. So often we will take that, and the codec we use as an intermediate. So we'll, first of all, we'll have our, uh, we will probably ignore and dump the, uh, the 264 that we originally used for our catch up. We'll get rid of that, and we'll go back to the original uh, capture, which may have come in as uh, J2K, might have come in as 265. Interesting. We don't really care. We'd have turned it into XDCAM 50, okay, which was. MPEG-2, isn't it, I think? Yeah. Inside yeah. there with an MPEG-4 <laughs> proxy. MPEG-2 codec, yeah. Nerds. Um, and um, we will then edit that, produce something at really high quality, and then we'll do a multi-pass MPEG-4, so. Yeah, you know, I was okay. going to mention that, actually. We're still using, we're, we are using uh, XDCAM50 for production, post-production, and everything in between. So it actually goes through three different codecs before it gets yeah. to the end. <laughs> okay. We'd like to compress that as much as we could. <laughs> we could. Yeah, sure. only use a couple okay. if we can. Sure. So, I mean, maybe following to, um, to, to what Chris said, I mean, what, what's relevant for us as we're, we're serving over a thousand linear channels 24-7, it's really about the efficiency of the codex, right? That's, that's really something we... Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll fix that. Yeah, so that's what we care about, right? It, um, um, we need to be able to really also do, I mean, we have uh, um, high traffic channels, but we also have low end, uh, low, long tail channels, and you, you don't want to spend too much encoding power in that because it also costs money, no matter if one person or, or a million people uh, uh, watch. So, so that's really one of the things we're really looking for to see, okay, how much, 
how much can we get, how, how well can we do compress with the, with, the, um, with the codec and how many channels can we get on one server uh, there. Uh, Are they live channels? Yes. Are they vault yes. served? No, no, that, that's really 20, uh, a thousand linear channels. Oh. It's BBC, it's, it's ARD, it's everything that's right. relevant in, in Europe. Well, interesting. So, um, you know, Dan, you selected HEVC. Now you have, I think you're the only one on the panel who really has a hardware-based encoding mm -hmm. process, and that's what your product is. Yes. Right? Um, so, you know, talk us through your thought process around that, and um, yeah, I mean, even in terms of future codec selection, like what do you have to think about, not only being a live service, but being hardware, right. that maybe the others don't have to think about? Absolutely. I mean, it, the decision for us absolutely starts with silicon, right? So we could be very interested in a codec, and just as an example, we were very interested in VP9 as a codec for other reasons, quality, licensing, you know, being one of them, but there is no encode silicon for it, right? There's decode silicon, but not encode silicon. So it, it, we might be interested, and we're interested in all those other parameters, certainly licensing being, you know, one of them, but we have to start with the question of, is there silicon for it? And there was for HEVC. And silicon that met our needs, which is you know low enough power that we can run from battery, low enough latency that it works for our you know latency profiles. Once we answer that question, then we can start worrying about all the other ones. How how quality is it? Yeah. Who's got the best implementation? What what are the licensing concerns with it? But we yeah. start with that question of what are the silicon vendors doing? Awesome. So, I, I'd like to the, the next question that's on my mind that you know I think would be really relevant, and I'll have you start, Dan, and then you know again everybody jump in is. What does your, or what did, you know, I guess looking back, what did your evaluation process look like um, in terms of, okay, you were considering VP9, you were considering HEVC, obviously for you, you had to look at silicon, but at some point you were, you were doing a pure, you know, video quality analysis, you were, you know, you're going through some process. What did that look like for you? And, so we were, we were interested in VP9 on paper, but we, it got eliminated so fast because of the lack of silicon support. So then from an HEVC perspective, it's, it becomes a, a quality comparison because when you're looking at silicon, you don't necessarily get the luxury of access to every feature within the HEVC standard to tune the quality to where you want it. Mm -hmm. Silicon will implement some, some parts of the standard, not others. And then our actual use case, low latency encoding might restrict you know, some other parts of the standard as well. So then we take a bunch of hardware chips, run, you know, test video through it, and we're looking at uh, both subjective and objective numbers on it. You know, PSNR is a starting point, and then the more sophisticated ones like SSIM, uh, and then also just all standing around a, a big monitor on the wall going. Little, good old fashioned eye. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Put them up side by side, yeah. mm, which one looks a little better? So even within the HEVC silicon vendors, there's a, an array of quality choices that you can pick from. And then you're looking at, well, this one looks great, but it costs too much, or this one looks great, but it draws too much power, and you're starting to put all of the kind of decision factors in a matrix and, and make the decision. And I think only truly hardcore codec fans then find that whole process super exciting. <laughs> so, <laughs> what 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 do the rest of you do when uh, you're my, my, my so before my selection is, is not made by my, by us? It's by the by the devices of the of the people who are yeah. going to consume our content. If they were watching it in Sorosons and Cinepack, I'll be <laughs> delivering that. So 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 Ed, Ed, I'll make it easier then. But still, there's a difference in implementations, right? So oh, yeah. you, you yeah. know, so there's the, the encoder A, B, and C. They all support HEVC or wh whichever. Yeah. And you're making some choice around that. Oh sure. So so um, there's always going to be. Uh, the, the bottom line. I mean, the cost will always raise its head at some point in this, and we can't just pretend everything is just technical. So the cost will be a, around hosting, around power, around efficiency of space within a server, mm. how, many, how much we can fit in density, and in, in, uh, whether we can spread it across multiple um, nodes. There's a lot of technical overhead, and, but it's all down to cost. Um, we'd love to have HEVC. We reps absolutely would, because we can see we could operate more efficiently our bandwidth, which is one of our greatest costs. Um, but while we have to support so much 264, we can't realize that cost saving because we have to run a tandem stream and that would just be 
ridiculous expensive. So we really have to wait for that sweet spot when the older devices have just died away naturally, then we can switch the H265 mainstream and just turn off the 264. But, but are you primarily relying on you know, subjective, um, so using ah, your eyes or right. objective That's a good, good, interesting point. So this has been an uh, a internal battle for a, for a while, <laughs> um, trying to decide what quality is. Yeah. It's a difficult thing, right? <laughs> and um, using a reference-based evaluation is kind of meaningless to us because all our content that we receive is going to be compressed. So we, we never have that original reference point. So it, it has to be a subjective and non-reference-based. Non so we do a comparison system. We have a, a user-based comparative system where um, the staff within Perform and, mm -hmm. and within DAZN are, are able to actually compare the two signals and decide which one they prefer. We don't ask them very many questions, we just want to know which one they prefer. And our aim is to, is to, is to educate a, a machine learning system uh, to recognize <laughs> what it is that uh, people prefer about each individual sport and then give a sort of a reference value to everything so we can relate quality from one to another. Right, well, yeah. You'll love to hear about Vista, and I, I want the others to answer, then I'll tell you about Vista. <laughs> We've developed. Okay. Windows 96. But, oh, no, no, no. Okay. no, no, Not an OS. <laughs> All right. Not an OS. That sounds very familiar. We did the same thing, not just for codec selection, but also for codec parameter yes, tuning. Exactly. So, so we put up two screens, and we pulled up people from the, from exactly. the offices. The, the, okay, the which thing one is like always that? motion. Yeah. Uh, we look at you know, macro blocks. We're obsessed with with quality in, in really kind of geeky ways. Yeah. What we really want to know is what people like. Yeah. That's, that's much harder yeah. to, to. And, and, and I mean, live sports and soccer is a very special yep. thing, right? It's, yep. it's all about the motion. It's, I mean, 50 frames per second versus yep. 25 frames per second much, makes a much bigger difference than, I don't know, this, this little. Oh, absolutely. Thing. It makes a lot, I'm gonna get on my high horse and start ranting about 4K <laughs> in a minute, but you know, okay. I, I, I don't find the, the benefit in, in having big pictures, but having good quality motion is, is yeah. important. Yeah. And that's definitely a part of a codec. Right? And, and yeah, exactly. And, and this is interesting because you're also doing a, a live events, sporting events, and and you know I think uh, one of the you know interesting takeaways is is that it depends on the content. If you have entertainment content, and it's and it's VOD and it's Hollywood movies. Now, of course, there's a lot of action and you know in that, but it's a different. You're you're optimizing. You're designing your systems. I don't want to say radically different, but you're looking at different things. Mm. It's, it's radical in between, I don't know, golf and horse racing. I mean, mm -hmm. it's completely different. So to That's optimize true. it is, is That's is true. Key. That's true. So we need to have a codec where we can, we can, we can tweak. That's right, yeah. It, 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 what, are, what are you doing, Stefan? Yeah. OK, uh, yeah, so as I said, I mean, we do those side, side by side comparisons. I mean, the last time we had to pick uh, a new codec was when we decided to bring Ultra HD content on the platform, linear Ultra HD content. Yeah. And so we, I mean, we, we didn't start by saying, okay, what's the quality levels that we want to achieve or so, but we, we started by saying, okay, which platforms do we want to address? So we said, okay, Apple TV is one very essential platform for us. What does Apple TV support? No VP9, no AV1. Uh, so the, the selection was pretty quick. And then, and then for us, the, the, other, the other part of the equation is what can we implement into our platform? We've been um, building, especially our video pipeline, we've been building ourselves, we've been optimizing to this use case of a thousand linear channels, um, uh, a lot of live to what um, use cases and such. And we used open source components for that, so we needed to find a good, a good way to do HEVC with open source, with FFmpeg or X265. And that, in the end, led us to the decision to, that's what we want to do. We, we do 10 bits. And, 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 and so it, um, as you're looking even at you know, encoder parameters, are, are you relying heavily then on subjective viewing? Uh, you know, since you're doing live channels, you must have some QC in the network that you're, you're getting some analytics off players. How Absolutely. much is numerical versus you know, subjective? Uh, so, so, re so really on the, on the pure picture quality, we really rely on, on really comparing this setting with this yeah, setting. Yeah, and we, I mean, it's, it's obvious if you, lose, if you lose low on um, FFmpeg and high, you'll see the difference, right? But, 
but um, or ultra fast versus versus uh, versus high. Um, but um, in the end, what we did is decide on one on one setting as a default, and then for a certain content where we say it's something that a lot of people see and, and watch, then then we we actually spend more processing power on that and make the overall picture. Okay, cool. And I certainly agree with everything everybody said. Uh, all those all those uh, options are, are are very good and valid. Uh, the one I'd like to add is audience uh, selection that, mm -hmm. that we we've evaluated. Uh, we, we get audience metrics back on, and we can set a code heart do down one path and a cohort down another path, and see uh, see which you, see which one uh, comes out with more uh, adoption, mm. more more eyeballs. Uh, so that's that's one thing that we've done, and we haven't done it for HTVC versus H two sixty four. But for example, we've looked at our uh, ABR uh, resolutions, tried out different di resolutions mm -hmm. for sport content, uh, different content and come up with a, a new version of the ABR that uh, we think more closely rep represents what uh, people are actually watching. So you have dared to deviate from TN 2224. Mm. <laughs> You're living dangerously now. Uh, that's a kind of a, you know, that's the Apple Techno, the H, original HL, HLS mm. uh, spec, yeah. which is now 15 years old. Yeah. And, and, yes. and I'm, so, I'm making a joke for, for a purpose, is that it's amazing how many services just like, that's the gospel. Yeah, that's where And talking. encoders have gotten so much more efficient. They're, they're transmitting too many bits over the network. It, anyway, it's a, I wrote a blog post about this so, <laughs> a couple years ago. I was very passionate about it. Like, it's time to get rid of 2224. Anyway, um, so what is the role of playback support? Um, and, and, you've, and we've already kind of you know, addressed this. And of course, on one hand, this is like super like, okay, why even ask the question? Because if you can't play back a file, a la AV1, as exciting or maybe not exciting as that codec may be, where am I gonna play it back? A Mozilla browser? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Yeah. So, I mean, only a Mozilla browser. Um, so I'd be curious, you know, talk, talk to us about how you look at playback support. And I think what I'd really love, you know, if you can share some detail is, what do you do when you've got maybe 80% of devices that support and, and you kind of say, can I afford to kick off 20% of my users because I'm going to get advantages or do I need 100% coverage? Walk through that. Maybe we'll start with you, Ed. Well, that, that, is our, that is our struggle. That, that's that, your that daily is, struggle. That's the daily yeah. struggle, yeah. trying to find out what that number is. And yeah. there comes a point when, there will come a point, almost certainly, when we will look at the state out there and say 265 is the way to go. Um, when the money we will lose by dropping off 264 will be beaten by the, yeah. quant, the cost savings. And I use the word cost savings rather than quality savings because I don't f immediately think, oh, we're going to double our bandwidth and go for a huge pictures. We want to maintain the quality, but we want to half the costs yeah. of the transmission, yeah. right? Yeah. The quality's fine. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the cost that's, that's, yeah. that's tough. Yeah. But we've got a real strong motivation to get onto 265, yeah. but we've got to make sure that the customers are not going to end up sort of hating us because we're not supporting their devices anymore. Yeah. Um, so if AV1 comes along and, 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 and it, it can work live with our latency, with uh, full device support, of course we'll put, we'd, we'd play along. But I, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm going to retire in 15 years. I don't think I can hang around. <laughs> okay. And it's easy, though, to get caught in the trap, right, of we have to support all of our users. Yeah. You know, and do you really? <laughs> exactly. You know, and for the 18 people who are on some, you know, 12-year-old, 15-year-old device, like, <laughs> Okay, it's kind of time to upgrade. <laughs> well, I think I think the worst thing that might happen is they, they might find that their their old iOS eight phone won't work. But hey, you've got a PlayStation there; you could use that instead. And they yeah. may not realize it, but yeah. they probably, yeah, exactly. probably of course. more people can probably play back two six five than actually yeah. aware. So it's it. So sometimes a little bit of tough love is a little bit of a push yeah. to make yeah. people just change their viewing habits. It's, now, now, Dan, this is uh, interesting because of course now your contribution. But uh, explain to us. From the field, it, it, do you supply a set-top box, or what are you streaming to from your appliance? We do supply a decode server. Yeah. Uh, so I would love to say, like, oh, we don't have to get involved in that decision of, like, playback devices at all. You do, yeah. But it, it, there's, a, there's a subtle way we get involved in the middle, which is we know a lot of people are going to stream 265 using our field of contribution encoder, hit our software, whether we're hosting that in the cloud or on a decode device, and then turn that into 264. So if we didn't think they could do that efficiently, if that was gonna add a ton of latency, or really hurt the quality, or require a ton of CPU power, yeah. so it was gonna be costly at that middle mile step, 
then it wouldn't have been a good decision for us. So those were factors to say, all right, they're not gonna use R265 as the actual final middle mile and last mile part of the distribution, but what's that first mile to middle mile transition step gonna look like? Are we enabling that step to be cheap enough, low energy enough, you know, uh, easy enough to do for them? And we decided with 265 that it was, right? That's 265 great. to 264, fairly easy transition for FFmpeg or many other libraries to do, so. It works out. And, and, and your server is actually doing that transcode? Yep. or Okay, so they could take the HEVC stream or you give them an H264 transcode. Correct. Uh, yep. Of what's coming off the, the appliance in the field. Yep, exactly yeah. right. Or, or decode, I suppose. Just yeah, baseband, of course, a large portion of our users are just taking baseband out and then plugging into whatever encoder. Sure, sure. Want, so. yeah. But a growing number are doing the transcode right on our software. And, and moving on as IP. Awesome, awesome. And remind us again, I mean, you put out a report and it's like a staggeringly high number of hours that were streamed in HEVC, right, last year? Or yeah, so it, for, for our, I should have pulled those numbers right before I came here, but for our user base, as soon as we introduced HEVC, I mean, so everybody's kind of touched on the, the cost factor here. I want to do the same quality at half the bits mm -hmm. rather than double the quality of the same bits I was using. When you're paying for, Cellular bits, as, as part of that, that's a, a huge really difference. really matters. Yeah. As soon as we introduced HEVC and it was like, oh, I can use half of my total cellular allocation and you know, uh, have all that money saved or do double the hours streamed, uh, of course our, our customers jumped all over it. So we just, we saw HEVC adoption across our fairly closed ecosystem, so it was a little easier to adopt, it kind of skyrocket very quickly. That's amazing, cool. And that's, that's, I think that's a perfect world to have where you really have a few clients and then, and then basically if they support it, you can move on. For us, it's a, it's a little different. Of course, we I mean, support Android down to what, 4.1 and then you'll have the, the, the phone that won't, that won't be able to do HEVC. Um, but I think also what we, will, what, what we are planning there um, to use HEVC also for our popular HD channels mm -hmm. and have a parallel track. So have H, H.264 for a while and have H, HEVC in parallel. And I think for us, it's always about um, calculating the cost which we would save from the in the distribution and and matching that on what we what we pay for the additional encoding, right? That's that's kind of where 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 it's. I, I think there's a point, and I I don't have a number yet, but a, a couple of ten thousand users uh, uh, per month, I think, will already pay the bill for the additional encoding. Uh, um, so so that's kind of that's where we're at. We, we we wanted to get Ultra HD straight and then move on to HD uh, and have this dual track of lower, lower, lower yeah. resolution profiles yeah. in, in HEVC, for exactly. example. Exactly. Exactly. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So when we uh, consider another codec like HEVC or AV1, there's really two questions. Uh, first, at what point does it make sense to add another codec uh, and support all the packaging and encoding and everything? Uh, double and double up your storage. And second, at what point would it make sense to, to uh, switch to an entirely new codec? I think the second one's pretty easy to answer. You have to have almost 100% adoption before you'd, you'd ever do that. So the other one's the more interesting question. And actually there was a, a guy, um, uh, let's see, I've got it right here. Uh, Yuri uh, Resnick from Brightcove uh, did a talk on ABR streaming and uh, CDN performance and he used a lot of math to analyze the change in CDN cache miss probability to try and help answer the question. Mm -hmm. uh, and his, his answer depends on a number of factors, of course. Um, but uh, basically, if you half the bandwidth at, with HEVC, you could, uh, you'd want at least 82% 82, 82 uh, of the uh, devices in your audience pool to support HEVC before you'd achieve the same cache miss, right? Okay. So, which is an interesting. That's interesting right, because right? the number, because by the way, is 78%. Right, right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is, I, was that a talk just, at NAB? That no, I think did? it was right before. That's just in okay. the last month or something like okay. that. I just talked to him last I night. I missed that. That's good. Yeah, yeah. I'll have to make a note of that myself, actually. Yeah, yeah so we're not <laughs> we're probably not there yet, but we're getting close. We're getting okay. really close. On the other hand, um, if you take into account the cost of traffic on your origin, uh, then the number was even lower. It was like a third, um, okay. depending on a whole lot of factors. So, you know, where, where do you fall in, in the factors that, that are for your particular business? Um, of course, you know, CDN costs aren't the only cost that you have in that decision. There's, there's uh, encoding costs, there's the, the development costs, obviously, are the, a big piece. Um, so we kind of think that it's around 90, 100% is probably, is probably our target for that sort of thing. 
One of the nasty costs that we found lurking was our entire monitoring infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, <laughs> yeah, wasn't supporting 265. So right. one of these sort of hidden costs yeah. where we have, like most people here, we have a, a large number of channels of concurrence, mm -hmm. and that they, it wasn't a considerable, inconsiderable cost to suddenly change yeah, all our yeah. multi screens, and yeah. uh, it's a bit of a, right. a hidden cost. So I, you know, I actually had in my notes here to bring up the question about operational uh, economics. You know, that because. Clearly, it's easy to kind of look at CDN savings, um, but all of these codecs, by the very nature, they're more advanced. They also require more compute. Mm. Um, certainly, we have the benefit of Moore's Law and, you know, and these amazing um, public clouds that give us very low-cost compute. But at the end of the day, they do cost more. So um, I, I think the latest I saw, just for kind of point of reference, is you know, HEVC is maybe roughly, you know, twice as, uh, you know, two to three times as complex of an encoding operation as H.264, though that gap is, is, is closing, you know, mm -hmm. quite quickly. But still, it is, it does take more compute. AV1, on the other hand, is like 100x, yeah. and it will get to 10x, and it really will, it, you know, but still 10x. Yeah. So... What kind of modeling and how do you guys think about that? And you know, you have to think about it because that's okay. real cost. Mm -hmm. I mean, those servers are. Yeah. I, I have a uh, jump in on that one because I've, my my big problem for that is uh, uh, ten bit decode rather than encoding into a codec. Yeah. That is becoming more and more efficient. I mean, I can think of one codec manufacturer. I won't mention their name, but they are very efficient indeed. So compression is is not my problem, but decompressing. You hit uh, your yeah. server with a 10-bit uh, 422, and you're going to, and particularly if you're working in a virtual environment, and you're not sure exactly what the contribution coming in is going to be, you have to reserve a very large instance. Um, so that that's where I'm looking for some kind of improvements. So uh, d just to jump on that, that that's really true because um, it, you know we're we're showing a full stack on a single server, and and the whole point is is it includes the decode. Because it's one thing to show, like, hey, look, we can, we can process all these in parallel, all these files, but to decode a high bit rate, yeah. mm. then transcode it, and then package it, and then output it on a single server, mm. and for live, and Chris, you know this. Rate, it's a bit depth. Yes, <laughs> That's exactly. the killer. That's and, the killer. And, and to do 10-bit <laughs> is very <laughs> tough. So, yes. Yes. yeah, yeah. So that, that's the that's whole what, cool. what, What's your guy's experience? I mean, how, how much ultra HD 10-bit channels can well, you put on, I, I mean, on one I, server? Well, I mean... I, I, I'll just answer it and then we'll move on because it's not a Beamer pitch, but, <laughs> but, um, but, but, but we can do a, f a five layer ABR stack, um, one 4K P60 10 bit at the top and then it goes to 1080, yeah. 720, so on and so forth. But that includes high bit rate decode yeah. and the whole transcode process. On a single, it's a Amazon C5 18 extra large. So I mean, it's a beefy machine, yeah. but yeah. Yeah, exactly. it's a single that's machine. To, that's a, that's so, a really yeah. big deal. But if you make it 10x, 10x yeah. for AV1, then you need a, yeah. a super beefy <laughs> machine. Or exactly, and for AV1. Machine. So sorry, I, I, yeah. I haven't let the rest of you answer, but how do you, you, know, how, how do, how do you think about this, the economics? Yeah, for us, it's really audience adoption, I think. That, that's great that we can do 10-bit. Great that we can do 422. Uh, we we're looking at a codec that can do 444 right now. But, but really, it comes down to, is that going to uh, add eyeballs? Is that going to increase the audience adoption? Of course. I, I think the um, codec compression, decompression, make it a lovely little word, codec. Um, but we've talked mainly about the compression side, mm. to send it somewhere else to, to decompress. But obviously, in a transcode workflow, you've got a decompress first. It's mm. a dough kick. Not, yeah. not a thing, is it? But we, we, it's a, it's a, it's that, that that piece of the work I think is 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 the thing that um, uh, interests me most in terms of looking around places like NAB and looking for vendors who can improve our efficiency on the decompression side mm -hmm. of two six five particularly. Yeah. So you know, there's 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 a three vectors when you're evaluating a, a codec or an encoder. You know, there's a the speed, performance. There is um, the bitrate efficiency, so how small of a file can it make? And then there's the absolute quality. And I think we're all used to sort of, you, you can get one, but, but you know, like pick, pick which one. <laughs> you know, so you're going to get speed, but, you know, maybe quality, yeah, it's okay, you know, but, but you good quality, but uh, speed, you know. So uh, now, fortunately, there are solutions out there that you know we, we think you can get all three. But how, do, as you look at your services, uh, and you know, Chris, um, you know, I'll start with you and kind of I'd like each of you to answer. 
Um, do you look at one of those pillars as kind of like, okay, we want to optimize for all three, but if I had to pick one, it would be? Yeah, it's a really tough question. That's, that's exactly, you've got it, right? Um, our, our, our real priority and focus is really on the reliability of the streams on, uh, and make sure that it plays on as many devices as possible. Uh, and I think that we're not quite to that bar yet. You know, you know we're, we're getting there, we're getting closer and closer, but as an industry, uh, if I, if I get, uh, press play, I want it to, to actually play. I think that's the real bar that we're trying to get to still. Um, and that's, that's still tough to get to. So in terms of those three, though, um, it's, yeah, it's tough to say, because you obviously don't want to get up, give up anything. But in general, I'd say it's anything that increases uh, your um, total cost of ownership. Um, so, so, so performance, the basically yeah. speed, right. when you're talking a, a pure software basis. Right. Yeah. OK, interesting. Stefan? I mean, very much like what Chris said. Um, I mean, what makes your customers the most angry? <laughs> right. It's when the thing doesn't work, right? It, they, right. They're, they're maybe a little bit angry if the quality at their neighbors is a little better than, than your quality, but, but that's, what, that's what matters the most for us to have a stable system, to have a reliable system, to have a, something that we can scale. We'd rather put another server out there that a, a, a stream can fall back uh, than putting the same server to use to, I don't know, to squeeze out the last 3% of the quality uh, Got it, Dan. So again, you know, I think we have a luxury of a little bit different decision making in a bit of a closed ecosystem and, and being on the hardware side. But for sure, for us, it's quality per bit, right? It, we get the luxury of it's not really more compute power for us. As long as we find a silicon chip that'll do it and it runs within the power parameters we've set, then that answers our power question, right? That's what that chip does, and it's all it does. Uh, but we've definitely been on the contribution side, and especially cellular contribution side, we care about the quality per bit, and our customers care about the quality yeah, per bit, right. so it's a big focus for us. Don't make me choose. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, 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 live sport, we can't compromise latency. It's a really important thing. It's a massive challenge for DAZN. Um, working really, really hard to, to, to make that uh, as good as broadcast. We've got lots of things coming that's going to really hopefully take the industry by storm. It's, 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 a, it's a tough tough thing to get right. Um, in terms of picture quality, we want to be as good as television. We don't mm. mean why we should be a, a, a second class citizen. I think you know, our ambition is to be better than telly. We're not, we're not gonna sure. go for second place here. Sure. Um, on the other parts of the business, it's a little bit easier because we've got a, the perform part of the business. We, we do a lot of um, streams for the betting industry where latency is absolutely everything. Yeah. Quality can just take a back seat because okay. it's really, as long as it's not you know, impossible to see what's going on. It's got to be a, a acceptable quality and it's got to work, but the latency is by far the most important thing. So that's been much easier for us to focus on because we can deal with that. Um, but trying to deliver the, the highest possible quality to the, to the home, OTT, and also keep latency down it's, a, it's tough. Yeah. Ed, Ed, sorry, may, may I ask where are you at latency-wise at in the OTT no. world? <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Um, I, I'll show you mine. I work in the R&D, &R and we can talk offline. I can tell you where we're going. With it. Um, but okay, okay, okay. Where, okay. Well, where we, when where the we video are, cameras are rolling, <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, okay. where we, where we are now is, is not where we want to be. Um, okay. But um, yeah, the, 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 pro, the project, the rollout is, is so ambitious that okay. I, we have to make some compromises to get to market, to get the sport. I mean, that, just to defend it slightly, yeah. the, the, um, one of the reasons uh, we've been able to do what we're doing is because um, I think we're creating a product which is quite a low price point um, for people to enjoy sport. Yeah. And one of the things that we found in different markets that went around the place was that a lot of the people who wanted to do take on and view sport, just couldn't afford access to, that, to their own sport. Actually, These are kids who are the age of actually playing yeah, sport and couldn't yeah, actually see it. Yeah, yeah. So we were very keen to get out there and address that issue, um, and I think we had to compromise a bit on our latency. Gotcha. I'll tell you later what it is. Okay, <laughs> good. So this is great. So I'd, I'd like to open it up to some questions. We've got, um, you know, some full top, of yeah, <laughs> top, top experts here. We have, I think, four minutes or so left, and are there any... Any questions, comments? I have a question if nobody else does. <laughs> okay, well, let, let, let me really quick scan uh, the, any hands up since I can't see that well? Okay, all right, go for it. So for the guys doing distribution, I mean, I'm, I'm curious, 
are all the HEVC licensing concerns with distribution worked out from a cost of licensing standpoint? We, we kind of, again, got off easy on the contribution oh, yeah. side. The licensing was clearer even years ago, you know, I, early on. But. I'm not a lawyer, but <laughs> I don't think I have any interest in whatsoever because, because, the, <laughs> because the, the license is paid by the, the, yeah. by the chip vendor or by the software vendor. It's not paid by me. I'm, I'm using it, but it's, yeah. it's not my interest, right? And, that is, and, and, and that's absolutely correct. So, for, so the answer is, um, without getting into uh, uh, you know, all the patent pools and everything, for digitally delivered, in other words, non-physical delivery, mm -hmm. so which would be only UHD Blu-ray, really, or, well, there's <laughs> other physical delivery, but for digital, for streaming, there's no royalty. And okay. the device manufacturer pays in the decoder, it, it comes with it, and so you're, yeah, I mean, it's really not. Now, there is one patent pool that has an officially, quote unquote, announced their pricing, and, and so that, some people are sort of worried about that, but at this point, the, the train has left the station and it, it would absolutely kill the Kodak if suddenly they swept in and said, well, you know, I mean, basically they would get no royalties anyway because yeah. they just stopped using it. Yeah. So it's, it's very safe. Any concerns about royalties are, um, are either very, very low or it's information from like a year ago because mm -hmm. okay. the, okay. because the, the, um, uh, royalty scheme changed. Uh, I think it was maybe even more like 18 months ago okay. that they eliminated the streaming royalty. Gotcha. If Initially, they, uh, yes, yeah. it was a concern because it was pretty onerous. Yeah, exactly, right. Right. it was very onerous. The, right. I think yeah. if, if Design was to make a, a, yeah, yeah, a piece yeah. of hardware like a yeah. set-top box, a Design hard, hardware, then they'd know, have to. Pay. Then I have gotcha. to. That comes into the, into yeah. the equation. But as yeah. we don't do that, I don't think we do. I mean, it's been <laughs> I've been here for 45 minutes. We might have done it by now. I don't, <laughs> I don't know, but uh, certainly that would then be a, be a concern. Yeah. Gotcha. That's great. Well, good. Well, I want to be um, you know, mindful of your time and thank everyone for attending. Thank you for being a wonderful audience. I hope this was useful. And uh, you know, I guess we'll be around if you want to come up and ask any other questions of the panelists. So thank you.